And happy Mother's Day. Where would we be without our mothers? Well, we wouldn't be here, that's for sure. But uh, uh, it's a beautiful day out today, and uh, we're going to, instead of going out to a restaurant, I guess we'll have a little cookout. I'll be doing the cooking this today for Mother's Day. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 10, and the title for this uh, chapter is Christ's Sacrifice Once for All. Christ's Sacrifice Once for All. Okay, we'll begin with a word of prayer, and then I'll give you an introduction, and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day and for our mothers on this wonderful Mother's Day that we honor our mothers, and uh, we're so grateful uh, for the godly mothers that we have, Lord. And, uh, and Lord, uh, we just want to pray for the lesson this morning, uh, that uh, you would open our minds and hearts to understand it, and most importantly, to apply your teachings to our daily lives, Lord. And we just uh, give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, as a way of introduction, when, when Jesus died at Calvary, he made the sacrifice for our sins. We know that. But one, that one single sacrifice for, was for all people, for all sin, and forever. And that is what by, is meant by Jesus' finished work. There can never be another sacrifice for sin, and that's the whole heart of the gospel. It's the focal point of the Word of God and everything in the Bible uh, that it has to say about salvation. And this is what the 10th chapter of Hebrews is all about. It emphasizes the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ in contrast to the imperfect sacrifices of the Old Covenant. Our Lord's superior priesthood functions on the basis of a better covenant, the New Covenant and in a better sanctuary, the one in heaven. In this chapter, the writer is going to explain why the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is superior to that old covenant sacrifices. Uh, you know, sin has always been man's greatest problem. No matter what kind of religion a man has, if he can't deal with sin, it's of no value. Uh, let's face it, by nature, man is a sinner. And by choice, he proves that his nature is sinful. It has been said, we are not sinners because we sin, we sin because we're sinners. Now, let's see what, what Hebrews has to say about this in chapter 10, and we'll begin our study with verse 1. Okay, verse 1 of Hebrews 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, is, and not the very image of things, can never, with those sacrifices which are offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So looking at verse 1, the old system of Jewish laws only gave a dim foretaste of the good things that Christ would do for us. Verse 1 says they were a shadow of the good things to come, uh, not the very image of things. A shadow is merely a reflection or, or a, an outline of an object, not the object itself. It's an indication that there is something that casts that shadow. The shadow of Calvary, the Old Testament sacrifices, couldn't do the work for sin that needed to be done. The system was temporary, so it could accomplish nothing permanent. The repetition of sacrifices was day after day, and that day of atonement was year after year, and it showed the weakness of the entire system. Verse 2 explains it. Uh, for for then uh, would they not have ceased to be offered because that worshipers once pur uh, purged should have uh, had no more consequence of sin. So the Old Testament sacrifices, if they could have purged sin, the one sacrifice would have been enough. The worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all, and they would have no conscious more consciousness of their sins. You see, animal sacrifices could never completely deal with the human guilt. If they removed the guilt of sin, they would never have to again offer any more sacrifices. Moving on to verse 3, it says, But those sacrifices, uh, in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So that annual day of atonement did not accomplish remission of sin. It only accomplished a reminder of sin. And the annual repetition of the ceremony was evidence enough that the previous year's sacrifice had not done the job. 
True, the nation's sins were covered, but they were never cleansed. Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. You know, there was a desperate need for a better sacrifice because those, the blood of those animals, the bulls and the goats, couldn't take away sin. It could cover sin and postpone the judgment, but it could never bring a once and for all redemption. Only the better sacrifice of the Son of God could do that. So all those old, uh, old Testament sacrifices were like repeatedly signing a, a promissory note. But Jesus paid the sin debt in full. In full, yes, sir. Now, uh, we're going to look at verses 5 through 9. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'll read those verses and then we'll go through them. And verses 5 through 9, by the way, is quote, quoting Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me read those verses now. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, uh, but a body has thou prepared, for, prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not neither uh, has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, and he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So uh, it was God who provided the better sacrifice, not man. And in Psalm uh, 40, the verses speak of Jesus Christ coming into the world in the flesh. It makes it clear that he is the fulfillment of Old Testament sacrifice. His perfect sacrifice did away with that old system. Christ had achieved what the old covenant sacrifices never achieved. That's the remission of sin once and for all and the gift of eternal life to, who, uh, to whoever would partake of it. And then um, verses six and eight there, the writer states that God had no pleasure in those old covenant Sacrifice. It doesn't mean that the Old Testament sacrifices were wrong. They were part of the Old Testament laws, sin offerings. It means that God had no delight in the sacrifice as such, uh, apart from the obedient hearts of sincere worshipers. No amount of sacrifices could suffer for a substitute for obedience. God looks into people's hearts. And uh, I take comfort in that. Uh, I think you should too. You know, he... Uh, he sees deep inside of us. He knows our deepest thoughts. He knows our needs. And, uh, and that's what God was doing under those Old Testament sacrifices. He, was, you know, he wasn't looking at the animals dying as an offering. He was looking at those. Uh, they were obedient to the law, and they had a love for God. And he could see right through them, right into their innermost being. And verses 7 and 9 states that Jesus came to do the Father's will. This will, is, of course, is the new covenant that replaced that old covenant. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus Christ takes away the first covenant and established the second. The Jewish readers of Hebrews, uh, to whom this book was primarily directed, uh, would certainly get the message. Why go back to a covenant that has been taken away? Why go back to sacrifices that are inferior? Verse seven declares, Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy of the coming Messiah with the words in the volume of this book it is written. That Old Testament reveals the, the coming Messiah and all through the Old Testament. Uh, it's concealed, you have to dig for it, but it's there in every single book. Uh, I know Bernie uh, did his thesis on, on Christ in the Old Testament and he went through every book and showed where Christ was mentioned. Uh, now moving on to uh, verse uh, 10, it says, uh, by which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Believers have been sanctified, that's to be made holy, set apart for God's use. Uh, by the offering of Christ's body once and for all, the old, the old covenant uh, was done away with. And no old covenant sacrifices could do that. Uh, an old covenant uh, worshiper uh, 
had uh, to be purified through ceremonial sacrifices repeatedly. But the new covenant believer is set apart finally and completely and uh, perfected uh, for guilt-free service to God. Yes, it's a wonderful thing to, uh, that salvation provides. And then uh, we're going to look now at uh, verses uh, 11 through 14. 11 says, Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So the old priests, uh, Old Testament priests, uh, stood before the altar day after day offering sacrifices that could never take away sin. Then in verse 12 it goes on, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice to sins uh, forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Who's this man? Of course, it's talking about Jesus there. But Christ gave himself to God for our sins as one sacrifice for all times. And then he sat down in the place of high honor at God's right hand. These two verses show the contrast between them Old Testament priest sacrifice and Christ sacrifices. The Old Testament priests could never sit down on a job since their sacrificial services were never completed. But Christ sitting at the right hand of God is both a signal that his sacrifice was offered for all time. And look at verse 13, what that has to say. It says, from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And uh, so uh, he can now confidently await the final victory over his enemies. For when he returns, he's going to overcome every enemy and establish his righteousness, uh, righteous kingdom. Those who have trusted him need not fear, for as verse 14 states, for by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. They have been, uh, it states, we've been uh, perfected forever. Uh, believers are complete in Jesus Christ. We have a perfect standing before God because of his righteousness is imparted upon us because the finished work, that was the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know personally that we have this perfect standing before God? Well, the following verses, verses 15 through 18, are going to tell us. Let me read, uh, I'll read all three of them there. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us for after that he had said before this is the covenant that i will make with them after those days saith the lord i will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will i write them and their sins and iniquities will i remember no more now where the remission of sins of these is there is no more offering of uh, sin offering Okay, so uh, because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit testifies to this through, he, through the word of God. And the witness of the Holy Spirit is based on the work of the Son and gives through the words of Scripture, uh, verses 16 and 17 there. Uh, in fact, they're a quote of uh, the prophet Jeremiah, which uh, Pastor Ben is going through that book. Uh, Jeremiah 31, verses 33 through 34. Uh, are, are actually uh, quoted in verses 16 and 17 of uh, Hebrews chapter 10. The old covenant worshipers uh, couldn't say that he, uh, he had no more remembrance of sin. Uh, you know, the new covenant believer can say that his sins and iniquities are remembered no more, in verse, just as verse 17 states. And, and verse 18 goes on to state that there's no more offering for sin as well as no remembrance of sin. When a sinner trusts Christ, his, all his sins are forgiven, the guilt is gone, and the matter is completely settled forever. Now, before we uh, look at the next series uh, of verses, let me uh, just give a, a short introduction to them. You know, the Jewish people, well, they were tied into a system that kept them away from the presence of God. You remember in the wilderness, they, were, they had a worship in a tabernacle, and when they got to the land of Israel, they built a, a temple and they worshiped in a temple. Now in those places of worship, there were barriers that kept them from approaching God. No Old Testament covenant worship worshiper would ever been bold enough to try and enter that Holy of Holies. He would have been struck dead. Uh, even the high priest entered the Holy of Holies only just once a year. There was a thick veil that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. 
and it was a barrier between the people and God. Only the death of Christ could tear that veil and open the way into the heavenly sanctuary where God dwells. So with that in mind, let us look at uh, verses 19 to 25. Uh, I'll read the verses and then uh, we'll go through them uh, one by one. So we're gonna look at 19 to 25. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, for, for he has consecrated, consecrated us uh, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with, true heart, with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our bodies sprinkled with an evil, uh, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and not to good works. Uh, not forsaking, uh, let's see, verse 25, we're not forsaking the assemblance of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So, uh, looking at those verses, uh, it's, a, it's an invitation, a gracious invitation. It says in verse 22, let us draw near. Let us, in verse 23, it says, let us hold fast. And in verse 24, it says, let us consider one another. It's a threefold invitation you see there. And it hinges on our boldness into the holiness, and the, the bold, then this boldness in verse 19 rests on the finished work of Christ, as verse 19 tells us. And uh, uh, on that yearly day of atonement, the high priest could not enter the Holy of Holies unless he had the blood of his sacrifice with him. But our entrance into God's presence is not because of an animal's blood, but because of Christ's shed blood. Verse 20, if you look at that, it tells us this open way into God's pre uh, presence is by a new and living way. It's new because it's not part of that old covenant. It's in the new covenant. And it's living because Christ is the new and living way. His our high priest. We come to the Father through him. When Christ sacrificed his life on the cross, God tore that veil in the temple. And this symbolized a new and living way, and it is now open to all that believe and place their trust in Jesus. On the basis of these assurances, looking at verse 21, uh, that we have this boldness to enter in because we do have a living high priest. So we have that open invitation to enter into the presence of God. That Old Testament uh, priest got to visit the Holy of Holies only once a year, but we're invited to dwell in the presence of God every moment of each day. Think about it, what a tremendous privilege that is. Consider what's involved in this threefold invitation. Look at uh, verse 22 again. It says, let us draw near. So we must prepare ourselves spiritually for fellowship with God. Uh, we're able to draw near to God with a sincere heart. Remember, he looks at our hearts, our innermost being. The heart stands for the whole inner life of man. It's important that God's people approach him and they be right inside, you know, have the right attitude. And uh, in view of what Christ has done for us, we should approach God with deep sincerity and the full assurance of faith in that verse stress that uh, it is, is only by trust in Christ was performed for us the high priest work that gives us the, the access to the throne of God that we can draw near at all. Believers must come to God with a pure heart and a clean conscience. Fellowship with God requires purity. You gotta be right with God. You gotta have to confess your sins, be uh, uh, washed clean by the blood of Christ. And then verse 23, it says, let us hold fast. The Jewish converts to Christianity were undergoing severe persecution for their faith. And uh, that made them be tempted to forsake uh, their confession of Jesus Christ by going back to that old covenant worship, you know, going to the temple and offering sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews is 
tells them to hold fast, to persevere without wavering. And without wavering means not leaning. In other words, not to lean back to that old life, but rather to move forward, to endure uh, uh, without doubting. He is faithful that promised in verse 23. Look at that. Uh, he is faithful that promised. This is the basic truth about perseverance. It's, it's not that we hold on to the Lord, but he holds on to us. His faithful. We are kept by the power of God. Didn't he promise us? He said, I will never leave or forsake you. And he meant that promise. And we can count on it. And then uh, verses uh, 24 and 25. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. So besides fellowship with God, we must also fellowship with other Christians in the local assembly. Apparently, uh, this when this letter was written, some of the uh, uh, there was some wavering uh, among the believers, uh, and they were neglecting to attend the, the church uh, gatherings. Uh, note that the emphasis uh, in these verses is not on what the believer gets from the assembly, but on rather what he can contribute to the assembly. Faithfulness in church attendance encourages others and provokes them to love and good works, as these verses explain. One of the strong motives for faithfulness is the soon coming of Jesus Christ, when uh, they will have to give an account of their actions, and not only their actions, but their actions toward fellow uh, believers as well. Uh, so let's move on now to, to verse uh, 26. And uh, it says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. So if you have received the knowledge of the truth and received it, you're a believer. So it's talking to believers here in verse 26. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. And uh, it's, it's saying here in, the, in this verse 26, uh, it's a fearful thing to fall in a, into the hands of a living God. And uh, Simon Peter wrote in, in 2 Peter 2.21, for, uh, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, not to be saved is what it's saying there, then after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment to live it unto them to, you know the warning here in verse 26 is to the hebrew believers because many of them were continuing to go to the temple they had their feet in both places you know they were going to church service and then going to the temple you know and then the persecutors come and say well i'm jewish i'm going to the temple some of them were actually offering sacrifices there and that's really a front to to jesus's sacrifice they're going back to, to animal sacrifices. They were keeping up a front and pretending that they were still under Mosaic law. And in doing so, they were making it clear that the sacrifice of Christ was meaningless to them. You know, it, it really went against uh, their teachings and, and what, they, what they were supposed to have believed. Since animal sacrifices prefigured Christ's sacrifice, now that Christ had died on the cross, all of that was fulfilled. Therefore, uh, what had been done in obedience to God's command under the old covenant had become willful sin. What it's saying there is back in the old covenant, you know, they were doing right by, by animal sacrifice. But once that new covenant come in, to go back to animal sacrifice was outright sin, is willful sin. And to continue to offer uh, blood sacrifices uh, that had been fulfilled by Christ with his own blood was a frightful, terrible thing. You know, it's, a, it's rejecting uh, Christ's death and, and shedding it of blood. They were acting as if the temple sacrifices were going to go on forever. And we all know that 70 AD, the temple is completely destroyed and has yet to be rebuilt. The writer of Hebrews is telling them that they cannot look to the temple anymore because uh, there is no longer a sacrifice there for sin. If a person uh, rejects the truths of Christ's death for sin, there's no other sacrifice for sin available. There is no other way to come to God. They are to look to Christ rather than looking towards that temple. If they were to, if they refuse to do this, there's nothing left for them but judgment. 
you know, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, and this is uh, speaking of continuing in sin, knowing willfully that those uh, who have continued to offer sacrifices in the temple, uh, they knowingly and willingly sinning, this is an attitude which leads uh, an attitude towards the word of God, which God considers, calls willful rebellion. There's no more sacrifice in the Old Testament or the New Testament for what they call presumptuous sins. And we'll get into presumptuous sins in, in, in a little bit uh, down the line in a few more verses, uh, because that was uh, under Old Testament law, presumptuous sin was punishable by death. So what should a believer do uh, that has drifted away and maybe one of those Jewish uh, believers had gone to the temple just be, being uh, uh, afraid that somebody might uh, you know, throw him in prison or something. So he says, I'm Jewish, and he goes to the temple to prove. So uh, what, what should a believer do that had drifted away into spiritual doubt and dullness and is deliberately despising God's word? Well, he should turn to God for mercy and forgiveness. There's no other sacrifice for sin but the sacrifice that Christ made. And it's sufficient for all our sins. It's a fearful thing, as I've said before, to fall into the Lord's hands for chastening. But it's a wonderful thing to fall into his hands for cleansing and restoration. Now, looking at uh, verse 27, it says, but... Uh, a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation shall devour the adversaries. Uh, so just like the unsaved believers face consequences if they turn away from God's truth and act with a continuous deliberate disregard of Christ's lordship and a consistent spurning of the authority of Christ over their lives. We know that this passage speaks to believers because it describes those that have received the knowledge of the truth. That's in verse 26. And our God's own people, because back in verse 30, uh, it talks about them being God's own people. Uh, these passages, uh, 26 to 30, refer to believers who willfully sin after acknowledging the truth. These are people who get caught up in some sinful vice and, and get pulled under by it. Um, although saved, they profane the new covenant and accept, and they accept what God rejects and follow what he tells them to resist. God may choose to take people like this off the earth in, in divine discipline, where their carnal, uh, carnal way may continue throughout their lives only to be shown for what it is at the judgment seat of Christ. 28, verse 28. He that despises Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Talking about what I, what I mentioned, the, the willful, presumptuous sinners. Uh, they despise Moses' law. It speaks of willful sin under the Old Testament law of Moses. If a Jew had complete disregard for God's law and repeatedly sinned, they were labeled as this presumptuous sinner. And under the Old Covenant, uh, covenant there weren't any sacrifices for deliberate and willful sins. Presumptuous sinners were executed. And uh, so in verse 29, it says, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and who's, who has counted the blood of the covenant wherein he was sanctified and a, an unholy thing and has done uh, despite unto the spirit of grace. So if an Israelite spurned the Mosaic law and two or three witnesses verified this, he would be put to death. Now this being true under the old covenant, how about those who do the same under the new covenant, which is far superior to that old covenant? The answer can only be that the punishment will be substantially greater in such a case. In order to show that uh, this is so, the writer uh, showed this disregard for the faith in, in, in the harshest possible terms, you know. Uh, the apostate, that's those who turn away from the true faith, uh, on, from the new covenant has trampled, he says, they have trampled the Son of God on the foot and have treated as an unholy thing the blood of the 
in the covenant. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. That's sanctified, the very thing that cleansed them clean. And the words used here, he was sanctified, he of course, is referred to a believer. Uh, uh, this brings out the, the seriousness of the act uh, and to treat the blood of the covenant, which sanctifies believers, uh, as though it were an unholy or common thing, uh, is to commit a sin so grievous as to really dwarf the fatal uh, infractions of the presumptuous sinners of the Old Testament. And then to add to the offense, there is uh, insulting the spirit of grace. That's the Holy Spirit who originally drew them to the faith in Christ. This rebellion uh, clearly calls for a much worse punishment than is given under Mosaic law. Now, it is a believer. It's talking about a believer. So it's not talking about him going to spend an eternity in hell. But there are many forms of divine retribution that can fall upon a human life on this earth, far, and far worse than immediate uh, death. You know, uh, God, you will get chastised, guaranteed. And uh, in verse 30, it says, For we know him that had said, Vengeance belongeth to me. I will re recompense, re recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. So God does not always take the life of a rebellious believer, but he always deals with them. Vengeance belongs to me. And that was spoken to Israel, God's people. And the Lord shall judge his people is a, is a quote from Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. So it's, it's no idle threat. God himself has claimed the right to take vengeance and to judge his people. Uh, then verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Uh, you know, it, it would be fe fearful indeed for those who will one day face God, when the very God they have rejected and offended so greatly, you know, so it, it would be a terrible thing for that to happen. Uh, I'm going to, we're sort of running out of time, but I'm going to keep going and hopefully we'll get through it. If not, we'll, we'll pick up uh, next uh, next week on it. Uh, uh, all right, verse 32. Uh, well, let me go through the final verses and I'll go through them one by one. I think we've got about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, verse 31. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst you were uh, made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions and partly whilst you uh, became companions of them that were so used for you had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance cast not away before your confidence which has a great re recompense of reward for you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise for yet a little while and he shall come and will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in it. But we are not of them who drew back into perdition, but of them that believe. That's a, a lot to cover, but we're going to go through it uh, verse by verse here. Verse 32, look at verse 32. The, the writer of Hebrews is following up his exhortation on the judgment of sinners by God with the words of encouragement and confirmation. You know, he gave him, gave him the stick and now he's giving him the carrot. Uh, you know, uh, the, the readers had given every evidence that they were true Christians and, and he did not expect them to despise God's word and, and experience the chasing of God, uh, heaven forbid. You know, the readers had been willing he just wanted to let them know what would happen if they did, you know. Uh, the, in verse 33, the readers had been willing to suffer a reproach and persecution uh, when they were not being persecuted themselves. If you notice there, they courageously identified with other Christians who were in danger. Look at verse 34, uh, even to the point of sharing their bonds, which is being thrown in prison. And then looking at verse 35, in that time, they had great confidence 
in, in, in hope. But now they were in danger of uh, casting away that confidence and going back to their old religion. That temptation was there and Satan was putting it on them day after day. But they held true. They held true. Verse 36, the secret of victory was in their faith and patience. Patience means courageous endurance. And in verse 37, looking at 37, they lived in expectation of the Lord's return. We can be sure that Christ is going to come on the appointed day, and that's just as certain as his first coming to earth. Verse 30, 38, the just shall live by faith. That's a quote from a book of uh, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. It's also quoted in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and Galatians 3, 11. It's, what's interesting uh, is uh, Romans... Uh, one uh, verse seven, uh, it uh, in Romans it emphasized the just. You know, we got the verse the just shall live by faith. So Romans emphasized the just. And if you look at later, look at Ga uh, Galatians three eleven. Galatians deals with shall live, shall live your life. And then in Hebrews here in chapter ten verse thirty eight, it it centers on by faith. We are not just saved from sin by faith. We must also live by faith. And that's the theme of the closing chapter, chapters of Hebrews that we'll be looking into in the, the future weeks, uh, chapters 11 through 13. Now, in closing, uh, verse uh, 39 says, the believer who lives by faith will go on to perfection. But the believer who lives by sight, that's through the world, will draw back into perdition. Now, perdition can be translated in a number of different ways. So, you know, it could mean to perish or die. It mean destruction, eternal judgment, or it mean waste. And uh, the, the best translation I can find is the translation waste. In other words, a believer who doesn't walk by faith goes and goes back to the old ways, you know, back to the old life, uh, worldly life, wastes his life. He wastes his life. The saving of the soul, and looking at verse 39, is the opposite of waste. To walk by faith means to obey God's word and to live for Jesus Christ. We can be confident as we walk by faith, our great high priest, Jesus Christ, will guide us and perfect us. Okay, I got just enough time to give you a little recap, and uh, then we'll close in a word of prayer. Uh, so what do we learn in chapter 10? Uh, it states uh, that uh, the law only limited what would come in the future. It had to, it, uh, so repetitively offering Sacrifices over and over as the years pass wouldn't help the people to become whole. Uh, if this was a me method of reverence that worked, this practice would have continued, you know, but uh, everyone knows that the sacrificing of the blood of animals is not going to cleanse people of their sins. It was a covering uh, uh, you know, of their sins until the time that the uh, the Jesus came into the world and, and brought in the, to his death, the, uh, the new covenant. And this is why Jesus came into the world and offered himself as a sacrifice for the cleansing of sin of uh, mankind. He, he declared that there was no need for the sacrifices of animals, that this form of sacrifice was meaningless. He offered himself instead, and that having been done, he now sits at the right hand of God, knowing that his sacrifice has permanently benefited those who will believe in him. Because of this, the Holy Spirit has declared that henceforth there will be a promise between God and, and humankind, and the followers of the Lord uh, will hold his Lord solidly in their hearts and minds, and the, their transgressions will be forgotten. Well, that's all for uh, this morning. Uh, Let's close in a word of prayer, and uh, we'll see you uh, uh, at 10 a.m. for the morning service. Heavenly Father, we just uh, rejoice in your word and the teachings of your word, and we're so grateful for your son, Jesus Christ, who came onto this earth to provide for our salvation. And Lord, uh, uh, we, we're thankful for the, for the new life we have in Christ. Uh, we certainly don't want to ever go back to that old life. Uh, we're so grateful uh, for your wonderful gift of salvation uh, through your son jesus christ in whose name i pray amen thank you and uh, stay tuned for our 10 a.m service god bless